craft beer is a perfect metaphor for the American dream. Craft beer, first and foremost, is about the beer. You're taking raw ingredients, you're taking grain, you're taking hop, you're taking yeast, and you're putting them together in a way that can create something very, very unique. It has a very craftsperson component to it. There's an art form to developing recipes and combining flavors and, and tweaking a beer to get it exactly where you want it to be. Traditional styles of beer, whether it's a pale ale or a German Bach beer or a French Saison or a Belgian sour beer, whatever. We're doing really, really big, crazy, adventurous stuff. We've got a beer called Freak that's out right now and it's basically using wild yeast and bacteria and it's aged in oak and it's three or four years old and we just released it. Man, that, you know, whiskey barrel age sour cherry old chub was insane beer you know we make beer we like to drink making a beer that suits your taste the second part of that movement is the people and the local nature of the product you got people that travel that are educated that have good jobs and that have experienced beer all over the place and, and they're aware of what's going on they want to taste something that's that's artful that's a part of their community that has as much terroir as a glass of wine. They consider themselves beer connoisseurs and they try to pair it with different foods and different moods and different times of day. They know a lot more about beer. They know uh, the grains, they know the hops, they give you the feedback. It's a diverse crowd, a lot of bright people. Thirdly, yeah, it's, it's all about the culture. It's a really fun, fostering community. People are excited. Um, we, we do a lot to try and interact with the people and engage the folks in our community, and uh, they reciprocate by buying our beer. We have a Tour de Fat, the bike festival in 13 cities across the U.S., where people participate in a bike parade and uh, then come back and learn about um, alternative transportation and, and see local music and entertainment acts. I think we're really doing it out of passion and for the right reasons, and I think people really are grabbing onto that. We're really about that experience. We're about reaching out. Out, you know, looking someone in the eye and sharing a beer. That relationship that small brewers have developed with their customers and beer drinkers is a real special one. You know, when it comes down to it, everyone's having a good time and they're, they're just psyched to be there. That enthusiasm is really contagious. Colorado is unique, it's extremely unique. There are about 130 breweries in the state. Uh, we have the highest number of breweries per capita in the country. Colorado's great for breweries. Colorado is such a perfect place for craft beer because A, we have the, the myth of the West. The rugged frontiersman, which kind of transfers itself into a small entrepreneur starting a brewery, starting a, a brew pub or a microbrewery. Most people lived up in the mountains mining gold. And if you go back up in the mountains these days, you can still find hop vines growing um, around mine sites. Every mining town had it. Uh, in a Central City, you can still see what's left of the Mac Brewery, these old stone walls, if you go up above town there. Uh, in Silverton, they actually tore down the Silverton Brewery built a, a base for the Shrine of Christ. Supposedly up in Caribou, up in Boulder County, the, the stone wall up there, I've been told, is a, is a brewery wall. And then, of course, there's Coors, which has been here for over a hundred years, and they started out as a very small family-run brewery as well. Yeah, his original name was Adolf Kurs, K-U-H-R-S, in Germany, and he came as a stowaway. He was an orphan, had kind of a sad life, and like many people, went to America hoping for better things. If we fast forward to the 1970s, there were a few regional breweries here in Colorado, the Old Tivoli Brewery in Denver, Colorado, the Walters Brewery in uh, Pueblo. That was the scene. There were very few breweries and very few kinds of beers available in the late 70s. People began traveling more, more accessible. Airfares were coming down. People could travel abroad. They came back. Well, they, they traveled abroad and came back and scratched and said, why can't we get good beers here like we do elsewhere in the world, particularly in Europe? So they started home brewing their beers. They started home brewing their beers, and from that, the microbrewing, craft brewing scene kind of emerged. What you're going to make tonight is water, barley, hops, and yeast, so you're going to make beer tonight. We're going to do basic home brewing. There are three types of home brewing that we consider. Tonight's the basic. It's 
extract with grains, it's what it's called, or an extract brewing. Colorado is some of the most highly developed beer culture in the country. We have more breweries per capita. We, we produce more barrels of beer than any other state in the country. Not barrels of beer per capita. We produce more barrels of beer than any other state in America. You can come here and be surrounded by some of the world's best beer made by human beings you can sit down and talk to, people that provide jobs and culture and a huge boost to your quality of life. You know, at a time when our economy is in rough shape, and it seems like no one makes anything in America anymore. Craft beer is, is turning the tide in a small but significant way. Craft brewing has long been on the forefront of entrepreneurship and realizing an American dream. The American dream has come with uh, a lot of work. Belgium's really one of those sort of crazy American success stories. Avery Brewing is founded by Adam Avery and his dad Larry. My brother, I was helping him fix his roof in Berkeley, California. He showed me a brew pub. It was now Triple Rock. When I finally got the beer, I said, huh, this is more flavorful. It's not as fizzy. Heck, I'd drive out of my way for this. These friends kept saying, God, you keep talking about this brew pub. You should start it. I've been rich, baby, never. A lot of sleepless nights, wondering how I'm going to pay rent and payroll. There's a lot of a lot of struggle and a lot of effort and a lot of fun, of course, along the way. Adam, as he describes it, was a homebrewer gone berserk. He convinced his dad to go into the microbrew beer business with him. Early on, we were we were dumb and broke and didn't really realize what we were getting into. Shine a little light now. Let me fill up my cup. Where the money is going to come from for the next expansion. We ended up taking out a second mortgage on our house. My parents loaned us a little money. So we went down to the library and got out a book on how to write a business plan and wrote a business plan. We didn't really have a written marketing strategy or a branding plan or a sales territory set up or any of those kinds of things. So we kind of dribbled it into the banker. It was not one pretty packaged up thing. And he said, the way that you've dribbled this into me makes me think that you know nothing about running a business. And so I'm not even going to take your loan package to the loan committee. Yeah, we got to grow. We got to keep pushing. OK, how are we going to do that when the checking account is empty? I just thought that it would work. It just seemed like a, a great idea that a lot of people would like. Try not to lose your soul as well, I think. Craft beer in general is a very exciting industry where every beer has a personality, every brewery has a personality, and as you continue to grow, um, you don't want to lose sight of where you came from and what you're passionate about. We never missed payroll. We didn't pay ourselves for a long time, but we always paid our coworkers. I still have my full-time job. I'm a project manager at Infoprint Solutions. I come from Vigo. That's another brewery in Argentina that we started there. It was always the plan to get the company profitable, and then after the business could support itself, give myself some salary. I started with a couple of friends and the chicken coop, just selling beer to friends and friends of friends, making deliveries with the small car. Starting something like that in the Great Recession is a real challenge, of course. It was always full steam ahead with selling beer and brewing beer. Keeping the financing going was, was a real challenge. We started in one of the worst times in Argentina because it was in 2000. 2001 when when was a crisis over there and I'll never forget sitting down with my wife at the bank and we're about to sign the papers for the second mortgage and she looks up at me and she says you better make this thing fly people burn burn out the groceries uh, we got like 
10 presidents in just one week. He got pretty skinny at times, which is trying to keep things moving forward. And we've been profitable now about six months. Now it's, it's a business as 10 years old and, and people work there and yeah, a couple of families live from that business. And now it's an, an expansion and it's growing. Cash flow is still something that we struggle with, but we're able to pay our bills and, um, and keep moving forward with, with our plans. A big key to that is finding the right people. January 2008 started um, dabbling around, wondering, you know, well, I, it'd be really good to uh, link up with somebody who, who had a lot of experience doing this. And Danny was looking to move to Colorado and looking for somebody to partner up with. I remember it was a winter, and he gave me a call and said, yeah, we can meet. Uh, and Boulder, and so I remember I, I came with my notebook and backpack and, and ice in the whole floor, and, and we meet in a coffee shop, and, and I, I show what I, what I am, what I did. His English was pretty rough. And still I barely speak English, but <laughs> and that time I was worst. And, and I remember uh, the still, uh, the language was not an impediment, was not a, a wall, was like, was, was another kind of communication behind that, that, that we, was a really good feedback with, between us. I remember I, I say about, wow, well, if we start this brewery, we can put beer in cans, and he said, I was thinking the same thing. First of all, it was obvious that this was the guy. He had started his own brewery in Ushuaia, Argentina, back in 2000. He is a chemist by education and he, um, he develops, uh, knows how to develop a great recipe and he can fix anything that you see here in the brewery. So this is a guy that you want with you for a startup. So we meet a couple of times more and, and I returned to Argentina. I kept looking for space and then it was mid-April that I emailed Danny. I was like, Danny, I, I signed a lease. And I said, okay. Uh, the next week I sell my car and I, I start preparing the stuff just for coming back here. He emailed back, he said, um, I bought my plane ticket. I'll be there in two weeks. I came in here with just a backpack and, <laughs> and start the brewery. When I came here, also was in crisis, and we started this business in crisis too. In the fall of 2007, there was a hops crisis. It was the perfect storm of events that led to an extreme shortage of hops. Poor crop yields that year. There were farmers that had converted hop acreage to corn for ethanol. There was a warehouse fire in the Northwest that burned $4 million worth of hops to the ground. There was many things going on in the world and all of a sudden, brewers couldn't even get hops. And I say, well, uh, I think this is what we can do it because if we start in really bad times in Argentina and that business is still is alive, I think we can do it the same year. So I talked to Danny and I said, Danny, do you think we can get hops from Beagle Brewery Supplier down in Patagonia? And he said, I don't know, we can try. After a lot of effort, we, uh, we extruded five boxes, uh, five 20 kilogram boxes of Cascades grown in the Patagonian region. What we've come to find over time is that these Cascades from the Patagonian region of Argentina are different. They're, they're more spicy and more earthy than a traditional Cascade. That is the primary hop that we use in our pale ale, and we also use it in our India pale ale. So now we're kind of stuck with them. Even though the hops crisis has uh, subsided, um, we're stuck with them, but we also have this unique product that has resulted from the situation that we found ourselves in. 
yeah, it was crazy how much uh, beer we start selling in just the first month. During that time frame, we also hired on Henry Wood, who's uh, our director of sales and marketing. We make our beer, and then we sell our own beer, and then we deliver our own beer. We just load it up in the truck, and we go up and we meet the owner, and we say, hey, we're right up the street, we're your neighbor, um, will you buy our beer? And a lot of times, most of the time, they say yes. And this is uh, our shelf space. We're in here with the uh, other craft beer. We're on the shelf, got a great shelf space. The market is growing more styles and more varieties of beer, but a lot of liquor stores are not growing more coolers. So getting shelf space is tough. And when you have just two beers, then sometimes you get pushed around a little bit. Whereas if you have four styles of beer, or maybe six to eight styles of beer, and all of a sudden you're taking out that entire shelf. It's interesting, you gotta brew the beer that you love to brew, and you can brew well, but at the same time you do need to increase your product lines in order to um, get more established in the, in, the, in the cooler doors. All right, we'll go see the man. See if he'll take an order. Wait. Larry's the uh, owner, and he's also, you know, the buyer for the business. So I get to talk to the decision maker here, and uh, it makes things really nice and efficient. So Larry, I took a look back there, and it looks like you've got a case and a half on the shelf, and then you've got five of pale ale. You have five, six packs of pale ale in the back. Okay. And then you have a case and a half of IPA total. Okay, so um, we do two of each. Okay. That sounds good. We'll get it to you tomorrow. All right. All right, good. That's one of the things here in Colorado, the way we have with the laws for the liquor store laws, that you can only have one liquor license per individual so that in usually the owner of the liquor stores, they, they can't own multiple liquor stores in Colorado. And it keeps uh, beer above 3.2% alcohol out of the grocery stores, which makes it, it's a good re it's a reason why Colorado is so strong in craft beer. Trends right now here in America are that people are still drinking a hell of a lot of beer. And it's all right. Over 200 million barrels, and one barrel is 31 gallons, of which 5%, about 5%, are brewed here in America as, by small brewers. Craft beer and craft brewing, and especially beers, uh, are on the rise, and it seems to me that the trend in the light lagers that's experienced a little bit of a downward trend, off by one or two percent. People are, uh, as, as it is with their foods, and they, they really are paying more attention to uh, what they uh, choose to put into their mouth. People are discovering that there are other options besides what you see mostly advertised on television. And what you see mostly advertised on television is a beer culture that, you know, is not for everybody. But if you just take just a small effort to just search your own community. You know, the average person um, here in America lives with, on average, within 10 miles of a brewery. And in that 10 mile radius of a brewery, there are lots of people that support that brewery. And finding that culture will usually light up people's eyes, saying, I have discovered something. We are the state's first brew pub. We were founded in 1988, right here in this historic 1890s building. This year, we're crowning our 15th Beer Drinker of the Year. It's a search we started 15 years ago as a sort of lighthearted way to find the nation's greatest beer lover. It's a fun search. We are talking about beer. Every year, we put out a call to the nation's beer lovers, asking them to send us a resume that details their beeriness, their understanding of beer, how it's made, its role in history and civilization and making the world a better place. And it's all right. This is now called Lodo. Back in those days, it was called Skid Row. It was very much a neglected part of town where a few people ventured out and came down. Um, 
We were founded by John Hickenlooper, now the new governor of Colorado, former mayor of Denver. He opened uh, the brew pub here with a few other urban pioneers, including Mark Schiffler and Ron Robinson, who are still with us today here at the Wind Cube. This building, you know, he got for a very good price. His partners had some funding from the city to get things going because this was such a blighted, neglected part of town. There were, you know, incentives to come down and open up. And his premise was pretty simple. We're going to make beer here in this building in small batches. We're going to charge a little more for it and we're going to find an audience for it of people who want to drink really good flavorful beer that's locally made by people in the community. Colorado's always been a playground for us. Come here, play in the river, mountains, hiking. We heard that they were doing this redevelopment. This used to be the landfill down here, and now it's a, kind of an urban renewal uh, development. And, um, you know, we met with them, and we kind of bought into what they were doing and about living green and uh, having it a live workspace and kind of a place that you can walk and get to know your neighbors. Um, and so it sounded like the right place for us. And so we said, all right, let's make it happen. John's dream, and it's a dream that's been relived by many craft beer pioneers around the country, was to count on a place where great beer was made locally as a catalyst to get people to come down and go into parts of a city that they never ventured before. Anybody with any sense of a historic appreciation and old architecture, when you came down here in those days, you could see all of these grand old buildings, most of them just the shells of what they used to be, but these great bones for a great old city that have so much appeal and that in so many cities have been wiped out. I mean, Denver's done its share, sadly, of demolishing historic buildings, but a lot of these buildings here, they're still intact, and he knew that would be something that was, you know, in limited supply and would be appealing to people, and, you know, it worked. Microbreweries and brew pubs, they provide a shared experience. And especially if it's done well, if the, if the beer stands for something, uh, so many of the uh, brew pubs and, and even some of the microbreweries are very involved in the community. They are out there all the time trying to, you know, how can we help our community? How can we get more money for nonprofits? How can we do book fairs or, you know, food drives for the homeless? I mean, all kinds of those activities that the brew pubs just seem to naturally gravitate to. That builds community. But it was just an extremely novel thing to come into a place and drink beer that was made on site and to meet the people who made the beer, to see the brewing equipment like you can here. So yeah, it was very much a big hit. They're gonna eventually uh, have some two or three story properties here. The top story will be uh, uh, affordable housing, low income, you know, so everyday people can live there. The bottom will be uh, some kind of commercial uh, use, mostly housing on this side of the street going in. And um, then we have a business, a live workspace going right across the street. This is probably the most construction going on in Chapin County right now. Uh, I think they have seven projects going on right now. And most everywhere else, the contractors just have nothing going on. We've brought a lot of traffic down to them and uh, exposure and, uh, and it's kind of a synergy thing. It, it, it takes both of us, this development, uh, depends on us and we depend on them kind of to make it work because we're kind of off the beaten path and uh, you know you don't really find us from, from highway. Oscar Blue started in 1997 as a Cajun uh, restaurant. Dale started brewing beer downstairs in 1999. It grew, you know, pretty quickly to 2002 where we started packaging beer. You know, we were the first craft beer in a can with Dale's Paleo in 2002. I think that really differentiates us from a lot of other beers. It kind of puts us in a leadership position as far as trying to push the boundaries and do something different. Our beers are definitely doing that. We have a 10.5% Imperial Stout that we put in a can. I mean. You know, 10 years ago, that was a laughable thought to even to do that. They did the hard work, I think, breaking into that and letting people know, hey, you can get a craft microbrew if you can, and it's still a good beer. I think if you break it down into three things, it's better for the beer, it's better for the environment, and it's better for the consumer. The first thing is completely eliminates sunlight, a real negative thing on beer. It, it really breaks beer down. It cuts down on the amount of oxygen that can flow between the outside of the can and inside. The bottle has one contact point on the bottle cap and the bottle itself, so it allows a certain amount of oxygen to flow in between. And with the, with the can, we're able to fully eliminate the damages of light 
and oxygen, so it's, it's better for the beer. Second of all, it's environmentally responsible. I mean, we live in a beautiful place, you know, Colorado. A lot of our, our target is going to be to the uh, outdoor enthusiast crowd, you know, the, the hikers and the bikers and the, and the rafters and the kayakers. Uh, we don't want to carry glass with them when they're out, and we want them to actually you know, enjoy a beer at the top of the mountain or make a nice wrap, run down the rapids and have something there. Aluminum is 100% reclaimable. It also is lighter and cheaper to ship than, than glass. If you look at an empty bottle compared to an empty can, the weight difference is obvious. And, uh, you know, diverting fossil fuels to move those things to 26 states, uh, it starts to add up if you start to look at, you know, how much gas is saved. Uh, we also can ship 100 cases of beer per pallet as opposed to bottles, which ships 60. I feel better than glass because, you know, we go, we have glass from wine bottles and we see glass everywhere and just, it's just not, it's just not cool. Not cool in Colorado, you know, with the beauty of the outdoors, you know, you got to preserve that. I think that sustainability is living on the planet in a way that makes both uh, human culture a meaningful human culture possible while preserving our natural resources. So here at the brewery is part of the local smart grid project. We put on a solar array, a 200 kilowatt solar array, which is over 800 solar panels. Uh, we have two engines, which make electricity from the methane gas that we produce from our processed water treatment plant. And then the smart part of it is putting metering throughout our facility. So we know when we're drawing power and where we're drawing it, as well as Communicating that information back to the city, our, our power provider, as it allows you to do, is to reduce peak loads. And if we can reduce peak loads, then we have to build less power plants. You can have a good time and still reduce your environmental impact. That's my whole goal. What we're doing is trying to convince the people, local people here, to come here instead of going to the liquor store. My whole deal is not to go down the traditional brewery route where you package the beer and then ship it for single use and throw it away. My whole goal is to become uh, carbon neutral and I'm, I'm going to be there within 12 months from now. I designed this system, had it rolled and berthed uh, just down the road here and all welded up and berthed as well. It's just an uh, incredibly efficient way for me to um, get high quality equipment locally. So I basically built everything myself because I hardly use any electricity and if I don't filter, if I don't package the beer and if I have the people reuse, I will be very close to carbon neutral if not carbon neutral within 12 months. Our message has always been uh, making life and, and community enhancing choices is, is really fun, it's not a burden, and we believe that if people don't enjoy the, the choices that they're making, they're, they're not sustainable. I think that we have a great relationship with the city of Fort Collins. I think there's a mutual admiration going on. There's a real great synergy around uh, making Fort Collins a uh, role model community. We're nestled in what's now called the Brewing Triangle because we've got our neighbors, um, New Belgium and Fort Collins Brewery, and then we've got quite a few other um, smaller breweries in Old Town, and so it's just kind of a little hub area where people can try all the beers and everyone has something different to offer. We've got a, a college in town, we've got access to Rocky Mountain National Park, we're near a lot of fun activities, outdoor activities. So I feel like there's just a like-minded kind of spirit here that coincides with, with the craft brewing industry. People are adventurous and they like to partake in some of the local fun and that includes beer. Colorado basically chose us in a way. We have a really good friend who's worked at New Belgium Brewing Company now for about 14 years. And every time we'd come down the, to the lower 48 to visit, we would have a layover in Denver. We would just extend it to a couple days to visit with him, come up to, to Fort Collins. Really figure out that we liked the town a lot, really liked the area, and the, the, the beer scene here is so huge that we decided it would be a really good, good place to move to. In the Old Town area, there's a lot of small locally owned businesses. We coordinate on events. We've, we've had events with a little local bookstore. We've had beer dinners with some small locally owned restaurants. Fort Collins is very supportive of locally owned businesses, and that's definitely helpful. Some of the things that we do when we brew, um, we try to source ingredients and raw materials that are close to home. In a perfect world, we get all, all of our raw materials from Colorado. 
it's not realistic at this point, but we do use malt from Colorado, hops from Colorado, obviously water. We have some local wild yeast that we're taking advantage of and some spices and fruits. There's a, a farm out on the western slope called Delicious Orchards. We get raspberries and cherries from them, as well as peaches. We did a, a beer called Avant Peche, which was, was uh, local wild yeast and uh, you know some different bacterias, and we used 750 pounds of whole organic peaches in that beer. It was a mess, but it was well worth it, and it was cool to be able to partner up with, with another local business. We're a local business, you know? We're, we're your neighbors, we're the people you, you run into down the street. It's more self-sustaining to be part of the local community of, of businesses than to try to do, like, we support large businesses. The main thing that we have, it's, it's a cheese plate. It's, there's a local cheese company, they're Muko Cheese. The owners, a husband and wife, both started out working at New Belgium Brewing Company. Their cheese uh, factory is about a mile away. Uh, and then our plate comes with some crackers that are made here in town too. So we're trying to make sure that anything that we're offering, as much as we possibly can, is locally sourced. We're paying more for local ingredients and we're, we're proud of it and we want to partner up with them. We have a, a group that we're working with this year, they're, they call themselves Hippie Chicks Hops. They're, they're growing wonderful, beautiful hop flowers. We're using them next year and we're excited to use them and we're partnered with them on the front end so that they can invest in the equipment they need to try to make it work. So. It's pretty exciting stuff. The more we can source locally, um, the more sustainable our community is, and the more longevity we all have in, as business owners. Well, this is the second anniversary. Um, that's exciting. Uh, two years running the business and brewing a lot of beer. This past year we were also named as one of the top 25 new beers in America by Maxim Magazine, um, which was totally insane for a little tiny brewery like us that only distributes in Colorado. Um, so just a really big accomplishment this year. So we're, we're really excited about our second year. It means a lot. I, a little over two years ago, that space was completely empty, and now we've survived two years. So it's pretty cool. And two years ago today, we had three seven-barrel tanks, and now we've got probably a hundred barrels worth of fermentation space. We've really grown it. It's happening. There's a reason why we're here in North Boulder. We could have easily been out in a warehouse 20 miles east of here. We're here because of the community. We wanted to wrap the community around this brewery. Here they are coming to celebrate with us, and it's overwhelming to, to really describe what that's like. This is, this is the support of people who, who love what we're doing, and that feels great. Colorado, one of the top beer producing states in the country, alcohol is big business here. And this session, lawmakers are expected to tangle over changing the rules for who can sell what. Colorado is one of five states that has strict laws about the kind of alcohol convenience stores can sell and the types liquor stores and bars and restaurants can offer. Now there's a move afoot to change the law so that supermarkets and convenience stores can carry full strength beer. That would be a very, very bad thing for our beer culture. Kelly, how are the rules being debated? Well, the law has been on the books since the Prohibition era. In Colorado, convenience stores can only sell beer that has a 3.2% alcohol by weight. All the liquor stores are independently owned. It's one person, one license. The regulatory system was established after Prohibition for one license, one person, specifically to keep the mob out of the liquor retailing business. It was structured intentionally. And what they've fostered is the most competitive beer market in the country by doing that. So what you have is over 1,600 independent competing entities vying for beer consumers' business. Now mini marts are pushing to add stronger beers to their lists, saying liquor stores and restaurants are selling the kinds of beer that are only meant for their shelves, and that's not fair.
the small craft beer, the more ambitious beers that the beer geeks like us really love, they're a small part of that mom and pop business's store. What pays the bills in that store is the Bud Miller Coors Stella Corona. That's how they stay afloat, selling that beer. If the grocery store 50 yards away can now sell full strength mass market beer, the mom and pop shop has lost his ability to, to stay in business. So they close and our formerly healthy, successful outlet for our little small batch locally made beer disappears. What they're saying is that if you sell to, if you let a chain sell this, uh -huh. they're going to get these licenses, they're going to run us out of business, and craft breweries play into this because they say, if we can't drive down to the local liquor store, let the guy taste our beer and have him sell it there, we're not going to be able to get onto the shelves of the Safeways and King Supers of the world because we can't just fly out to their corporate headquarters and convince them to sell us. But convenience stores say it's just not fair that they're limited to the weaker alcohol that less customers seem to want to buy. Okay, here's the mom and pop store. He's been in business 40 years, working under the premise and the law that he can only have one store. Okay, he signed on with that and he's comfortable with it. Now we're going to tell him, actually we're going to change the law and now the Safeway Corporation that has 200 locations in the state, while we told you you could only have sell beer in one spot, we're going to give some giant conglomerate that's, whose money goes somewhere else the right to carry beer in 200 places. Do you think that's fair, Mr. Mom and Pop? No, it's not fair. If we're gonna be required to maintain this false delineation of beer, it should apply equally, and the law needs to be enforced equally, and it has not been enforced equally in the past. I'm not insulted by his quote, but it shows his ignorance. Beer is not beer. Beer is not beer. Beer is not beer. That's what's so wonderful about Colorado. If you think beer is beer, it means that you basically are completely ignorant of the, the beer renaissance that has been occurring in the United States over the last couple of decades. What we make is way beyond beer. It's, it's local, you know, we've talked about it. It's the local community, it's local jobs, it's art. It's made by passionate people that are out to change the world. I was a beer drinker in the 70s, and I don't know how old the person is that made that quote, but that person obviously was not around back then or is still drinking those same beers and hasn't experienced the, the massive variety and the really high quality stuff that's being made by little breweries all over the United States. The diversity of beer out there and, and the demand for, for these big challenging beers has really, you know, proven that if we continue to push the boundaries, whether it's, you know, going to a bigger, bolder beer or just, you know, doing a really high quality Pilsner, um, that it's going to continue to invite in new beer drinkers. People are going to realize, you know, what a certain beer brings out and what it means to them. So I think, you know, the grocery bill could cut down on the amount of beers that you can make and cut down on the amount of beers that are available to the public and, you know, maybe then beer is beer. There are people who have had these liquor stores, these uh, liquor stores across the state in their families for generations. So what's going to happen to them? So liquor stores start to close, so you're losing jobs. How many of these chain stores are going to add jobs because they're selling beer? They have the same amount of shelf space. There's no additional jobs to be gained. There are only jobs to be lost. There's a lot of independent liquor stores that are selling beers, and um, you know that provides jobs for the state of Colorado. Um, also, the sales tax that goes along with it, instead of going back to wherever that chain store may be based, um, it stays here locally and, and becomes part of the Colorado um, economy. And the profits from a locally owned store, like PJ's right around the corner here, his profits stay here in town. You know, he lives here. That's where it stays. Local charities can go to him and, and get, you know, get a donation or whatever. He supports a lot of the stuff that we support on the nonprofit side of things. You go to a, a large chain store with headquarters a thousand miles away, where do their profits go? To their shareholders scattered all over Kingdom Come. That money does not stay in the community. Breweries like Upslope would have to fly to California to meet with a 
buyer in Safeway and say, hey, will you take my beer? I'm pretty small. I'm on the front range. I can service about 10 of your grocery stores. Do you have the time for that? And he's going to say, you know what? I just need, I need to make a decision on how that can service all of the grocery stores in that region or whatever. Not to mention, we'd have a hard time coming up with the money for the plane ticket and the travel and all that to go do that. Instead, at the very beginning, I was able to load up beer in my small pickup truck, run down and see Nick at Boulder Wine and Spirits, and say, hey, Nick, you want to buy some beer? I've got it in the truck with a new brewery. What do you think? He tasted it. He's like, yeah, that's pretty good. Why don't you bring it on in? I can handwrite the invoice and done and let the product do the talking. You look at it, I mean, craft brewers, I think where they provide roughly 5% of the beer, and yet over 50% of the employees in the entire beer industry are connected with craft brewing. We have 50 employees here. 57 full-time employees. We have 35 employees. 41 full-time and, and six part-time. We have five employees here at um, Equinox and three employees at Hobson Berries. We're going to make sure everyone here keeps their job and keeps a paycheck. We offer great benefits. We have vacation packages. We have matching 401k. One of the things we talk about a lot at home is we're really excited about the number of employees we have because, you know, a year ago we weren't open. There were five jobs that weren't there. And granted, it's only five jobs, but it's small. It's, it's these small steps that help people out. They, they, they help out with the economic downturn. They're going to get people back employed. And even though we're so small, really like being a part of it, knowing that we're doing something positive. One of the things that I love that we do here is to provide a place for people who want to use their hearts and their heads and their hands. Heart because it leans to I still love my women from yesterday. So we had these three pillars. Um, one, ownership. One, open book management, where there was a lot of financial transparency. And one, involvement in the, in the planning for strategy for the company. And those have been just incredibly powerful for us. To whom do I explain myself? because we liked what we did and we liked being together um, and one thing led to another and here we are 380 of us All of those things are built on profitability and sales revenue and all those things. And I think cutting access to market, you lose some of that. If you allow six or, six or seven major chains to control 80% of the beer market, you've effectively created an oligopoly where pricing tends to go up and selection tends to go down. And these guys become the 100-pound gorillas in the room. They have the pricing power. They could determine what's out there on the shelves. And many, many, many of the locally owned businesses disappear. One of the things that makes this a great industry is the camaraderie among people. And I, I think that it's really important to dive in. Just a huge joy in this industry is getting to know so many fabulous brewers and brewery owners and, and beer drinkers. I would encourage people to dive into that. Craft beer is a perfect metaphor for the American dream. 
you've got to be creative. You've got to, there's got to be something different and better about your beer that you make. It's got to be uh, somehow differentiated, special, and unique, or else why are people going to trade from, trade from the beer they're drinking to your beer? Uh, so it requires a level of creativity and finding a different way, a new and better way of doing something. Well, that's the American dream. If you're going to start a brew pub or microbrewery, anybody who's going to give you any fair advice tells you you're going to work 70 and 80 hours a week for years, right? It doesn't, I mean, it's, it, you can't even consider doing it unless you're willing to work that hard. That's the American dream. We try to plan ahead as best as we can to know when we're going to develop another pinch point in terms of capacity. determined that we needed uh, three more 30 barrel fermenters, a new cold room that is three or four times the size of our old cold room, a new chiller. We have a, <laughs> our original chiller was basically intended for a refrigerator or something. <laughs> and we have milked that old chiller for way too long. The canning line uh, that we have in place is much less manually intensive than it used to be. That was an important piece. And the tap room. We have a very small tap room, which is how things start. I've spoken to you know some other brewers, and it's the same thing. When they started out, they had a little tap room. That's what we have. We have a little tap room. We are expanding the tap room now to more than double the size of it to accommodate our patrons better and events music and the intent of being here in North Boulder and in this space was to wrap this brewery around this community and you know thank God they've come into this little tap room anyway and come in and see what we have that's new try something they haven't tried before and, uh, and so now we can actually potentially offer them a space where they can find a stool is to not drop the tank, getting it out of the back. Then we'll get them, uh, we'll get them vertical, and uh, same objective there, don't drop the tank. Also, we can't move in the room. These tanks come from a, a company in California called PBST. They own a factory in China. The last time this container was opened up was in China when they loaded it. Last time, back in March, there was only one Chinaman in the back. He helped out. I think this was a little rough, but uh, <laughs> he helped us out. Uh, step two, get him vertical. Oh, it's all the frame, it's all right. All right. Don't drop the tank, exactly. <laughs> Here. The next expansion is going to be the big one. People from backgrounds with no money, with, with no great success in education, through just through hard work and had some great ideas and the ability to get people to work together have built incredible successes. There's uh, something that my wife hung in her house. It's just this little sign that says, um, what would you do if you knew you could not fail?
Stand blue.